The Mighty Nine has been greenlit by Amazon Studios to be adapted into an animated series. People have been begging me to talk about The Mighty Nine in a video or at least make a reference to them in some way for almost a year now and I can't think of a better time to do it than right now. Um, however, Campaign 2 of Critical Role is over 140 episodes long, over 500 hours long, so I could do a series of videos talking about it and never even get close to covering all the finer points. So, for the sake of brevity, this video will be divided into very specific categories uh, as far as what I want to talk about. I will start with how I got into Critical Role, then I will talk about the individual Mighty Nine members, the characters, and my favorite episode and why I think this campaign resonates with people as strongly as it does. All right. If I miss anything, let me know on Twitter at erodbuster1 and I will do my best to answer your questions uh, directly. There you go. So anyway, this is a story of how I got into Critical Role. I think every critter has their very specific a uh, very unique story how they got into it. Uh, I think it's because Critical Role is such a unique uh, ongoing series that nobody just watches it casually. Either you're really into it or you're not. So everybody has very specific stories how they got into it. So my story is this and uh, for the past year that I've been watching Critical Role and talking to critters, I keep hearing a lot of critters say the exact same thing, and I'm about to say it too, which is, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, ever. Not only did I not play it, but it was something that was way, way, way outside my realm of interest. And then on top of that, I, to put it plainly, I didn't get it. I didn't understand the appeal of it, um, and the only thing that seemed more unappealing to me than playing Dungeons and Dragons is watching people play Dungeons and Dragons. So Critical Role was something to me that seemed insane. Like, why would anybody sit there for hours watching these people play a board game? It made no sense to me. But the funny part is that I was a fan of all the cast members of Critical Role individually through their voiceover careers because as you guys know I'm a massive animation fan I'm a massive voiceover fan so I was a big fan of all the cast members of Critical Role and yet I refused to watch Critical Role which is the thing that they are all best known for including Ashley Johnson who has done done more is the who is the one who has done most the more more mainstream projects out of the whole group uh, in looking back at myself and that mentality, it's the equivalent of being a Bruce Willis fan and refusing to watch Die Hard. So it's, it's crazy, but it's the way I was. So bear with me. So when they announced that they were doing an animated series, The Legend of Vox Machina, based on their D&D game that they were playing, I said, oh, hell yes, there you go. I love animation. I love voiceover. This is in my wheelhouse. I will definitely check that out. So this past February, when all the episodes of season one of The Legend of Vox Machina were available on Amazon Prime, I watched it uh, with the intention of only watching one or two episodes and then pick it up a little later. And five hours later, I have watched. I had watched the whole season and I was hooked. Um, and I watched it again and again and again. And after watching it 12 times, I'm not kidding. I watched all of season one 12 times. I, I needed more. <laughs> I just, I was addicted. I needed more. So I found out there was a comic. I got the comic and I read it over and over and over again. And I still wanted more. And here's when the story gets even more hilarious. Uh, I go to the Critical Role YouTube channel, the Critical Role YouTube channel, and I watch every piece of supplemental material on that channel except for Critical Role. You know how crazy that is? You know, it's like um, 
watching uh, a cable channel that's dedicated to one thing and only watching the commercials, only watching uh, the promos for the shows, for the main show that that channel is known for. Uh, it's, it's bananas, but that's what I did. I, I just needed more Vox Machina in my life, but I still would refuse to watch Critical Role, which is nuts. Anyway, so I was staying with my dad at the time, and he was going to go out for, he was going to be out of town for a weekend. Um, so I was going to be all alone. So the, for those 72 hours that I was going to be alone, I had made the decision that, fine, I'll put on Critical Role just to have background noise, just to have voices in the house, in the background, uh, while I spend these 72 hours alone. Um, but I'm, I'm probably not going to get into it. It'll be a good excuse to find out what the original, the source material to The Legend of Vox Machina was like. So I did that. My dad went out of town. The moment he left through the door, I put on campaign one of Critical Role, and I just let it play. And very much like I expected, um, I just, I couldn't get into it. I, it was just long and monotonous. I, I, again, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, so I didn't understand the rules of the game, how the game worked. Uh, I was very lost. Every great now and then, you would get a good reference to the Vox Machina characters that I appreciated. Sam would tell a joke or would sing a song, and I would enjoy that. But then almost immediately after that, I would get lost. I didn't know what was happening, and I would just zone out. So the weekend continues, and I, conti and I keep letting it play. And we get to episode four of Campaign 1 of Critical Role which I believe is called Strange Bedfellows. And we get to a scene where Vox Machina is, needs to cross a rope bridge. And in that moment, it happened. I experienced what the cast of Critical Role often refer to as the Hook moment. Now, for those of you who don't know, the movie Hook has a scene where Peter and the Lost Boys sit down to have dinner and there's no food on the table. All the Lost Boys are just pretending to eat and Peter gets very angry about this and he's like telling them, what are you doing? There's no food here. I want actual food. What's wrong with you? And he doesn't see the food until he starts using his imagination and all of a sudden he can see all the delicious uh, food items that are on the table and, you know, one of the kids says, you're doing it, Peter. And in Critical Role, anytime anybody gets really immersed in the fantasy and the story that they're crafting, somebody at the table immediately says, you're doing it, Peter. So on the fourth episode of Critical Role, campaign one, I was doing it, Peter. It happened. Like I said, it's a scene when Vox Machina is in the Underdark. And they need to cross a rope bridge, and they know there's all these dangers on the other side of the rope bridge. And they're just strategizing about what they're going to do. And in that moment, as the, the party was discussing how they were going to get to the other side of this bridge safely, I could see everything. I was like Emmett in the Lego movie when he goes from the real world back to the Lego world. I could see it all. I could see the Vox Machina members in the Underdark, right in front of this rope bridge that uh, is over uh, a lava river. I could see the all the creatures and monsters that were waiting for them on the other side of the bridge. I could see the stronghold behind them, the big structure that they needed to infiltrate to save Lady Kima. I could see it all. I could see everything. It, it's just describing it, I'm getting goosebumps because it was one of the most amazing experiences I have ever had consuming a piece of media. It reminded me of when my grandparents used to tell me uh, about listening to shows on the radio and how you had to listen to them actively and there would always be a moment in every single one of those shows where they would get so immersed in it that they would see everything. They would see the whole show in their mind um, when it was well produced. It was Critical Role is a radio play. 
but with Dungeons and Dragons attached to it. And from that moment, I was hooked. I was a Critical Role fan. I didn't know it at the time, but I had become a critter. So, once I started enjoying it and I started understanding it, um, I started doing a Twitter thread of my experience with the show, going from somebody who didn't get it, didn't like it, didn't want to be a part of it, to going to becoming somebody that was loving it. And the thread became very popular. Like I, I, a lot of people loved it, and people would ask me all the time, "When are you gonna do? When are you gonna watch another episode? I want to know what you you thought of it. I want to know what you thought about this character, this villain, this creature, this episode." Um, and I would respond. Um, and throughout that thread, people would constantly ask me, "So, are you gonna check out Campaign Two? And Campaign Two came up a lot, over and over and over again. And I was like, "Man, can." Why is Campaign 2 such a big deal? If it's such a big deal, how come they didn't adapt it first? Um, was my, my questioning. Um, so, my plan was to only watch Campaign 1 all the way through the Briarwood arc and then stop. Because I didn't want the events of Season 2 of The Legend of Vox Machina be, to be spoiled. I wanted to watch Season 2 of Legend of Vox Machina the same way I watched Campaign 1 excuse me, season one, uh, with complete fresh eyes, not knowing what was going to happen. So, but, after, I was thinking, I thought, okay, once I, I it's going to take me a long time to get through the Briarwood arc, um, and I think after that I'm going to be satisfied. There, you know, I'm, I'm going to be good. I'm not going to want to watch these long-ass radio plays anymore. I'm going to be fine. So I finished the Brian Wood arc and I rewatched The Legend of Vox Machina season one again because yes, because I love it that much. And guess what? I still wanted more. Um, <laughs> so hey, there's a cameo from Milo. So after after a few days, probably not even that long, maybe just over 24 hours later after I finished the Brian Wood arc. Um, I gave in and checked out Campaign 2. Now, as I just established, Campaign 1, it took me four episodes to get into it. Um, campaign uh, 3, I'm ca all caught up with Campaign 3 of Critical Role with the Bell's Hells. It took me 28 episodes to get into it. No offense to anybody, it just took that long for me to, for it to really garner my interest. I uh, was watching it very passively for 28 episodes, believe it or not. So, to recap, it took me four episodes to get into Campaign 1. It took me 28 episodes to get into Campaign 3. Campaign 2, it took me 27 minutes to get into Campaign 2 of Critical Role. And I tell you the exact moment when they hooked me. So I'm watching it very passively. It's like, okay, yeah, uh -huh, I get it. Liam's a hobo. Sam is a kleptomaniac. All right, uh -huh, got it. And then they get to the scene where they all, all the characters gather down in the tavern of the inn that they're all staying in. Or most of them are staying in. They get to that scene and Jester says her very iconic line that everybody loves where she turns to Caleb, whom she just met, and says... You should take a bath. Excuse me? You know, bathe in water. And that's it. Boom. I was hooked. And I, I even remember like laughing really, really hard during that whole exchange. And then immediately saying, I love these assholes. Um, <laughs> uh, and that was it. And I was into campaign two. And immediately I, I saw why people loved it so much and why they were so obsessed with it and why they so desperately wanted me to talk about it. Uh, and I will elaborate more on that later in the video. But for now, I am going to talk about um, the characters, uh, starting with uh, Captain Tusktooth himself, Ford Stone. So one of the coolest things about Campaign 2 is how... Campaign 1 
They never intended it to be streamed. They never intended it to be a cartoon. So all the cast members just play, chose characters that are either um, exaggerated versions of themselves or idealized versions of themselves. Um, with with uh, Travis, he chose to play a character that, while he was very dumb, he was very unfiltered. Travis could say and do whatever he wants, and it would uh, still be acceptable within the confines of the game. Um, Grog has no filter. He just does, says whatever the F he wants, and gets away with it. So, I love how for Campaign 2, he chose to go in the opposite direction and uh, play a character that's very personal, not only articulate and charismatic, but very personal to him. For those of you who don't know, um, Travis, when he was young, he was very small and, and overweight, and he got picked on a lot. And then suddenly, he hit a growth spur, and he got really tall, and all that baby fat shifted into all the right spots in his body, and all of a sudden, he was a tall, muscular uh, adolescent, and all the people that were picking on him are suddenly trying to be his friends. So he based Ford on that young version of himself. Ford is um, half-orc, so he is generally discriminated against. Um, he is a guy who, who doesn't see what's special about him. Um, and he's very cautious about who he chooses to be his friends, his companions. Um, it's a very vulnerable uh, character to portray. Um, Travis is very bravely putting uh, you know this very personal side of himself out there. So while Campaign 1 really didn't have much of a leader... Um, until it was adapted into a cartoon and Vexalia became the leader. Um, campaign 2, almost immediately, the Mighty Nine did have a leader, and it was Ford, because while the entire group is very antisocial, Ford was the one that really knew how to deal with people in order to stay safe and to not be harassed the way it was the way he was. He was the one that took lessons with Vendron, I believe, in order to know how to manipulate all others so they wouldn't mess with him. Um, and of course, you know, what blew me away is uh, how blunt and uh, rude Grog was, and then suddenly you're getting Ford, who is the most articulate and kind and thought thoughtful uh, individual in the group, in spite of his social, occasional social social awkwardness, he's instantly appealing. Just the way he talks, Eldritch Blast. You just love, love him. You respect him, and you can't. It's hard to understand why anybody would mistreat him. But sadly, that's often the way things go in real life. Molly Mock Tea Leaf. So while Percy was stuffy and snooty and very emo, uh, Molly is the life of the party. He is Lorne from Angel. He is Porthos from the Three Musketeers. He is somebody that has a lust for life and enjoys every moment no matter what he's doing. Whether he's drinking, having sex, having an epic battle. He is loving every, every moment. He is the guy you can't piss off. As long as he's alive, he's happy. So, and then came episode 27. And anybody who's a critter know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, stop the video here. Episode 27, when Molly dies. Now, here's a fun fact. Because I was so naive about Dungeons and Dragons, I had no idea that in D&D, characters can die. So when Molly died, it, it, it hit me really, really hard. It hit me harder than any fictional character death that I have ever experienced. And it confounded me. I was like, why? Why does this bother me more? 
than any other fictional character death. And after thinking about it for a while, I came to realize that when you watch a movie, you watch a TV show, read a comic, you are seeing these characters at their very best, on during their very best moments. And even when you see them during bad or difficult moments, you know that those moments are going to lead to good moments, to triumphant moments. With Critical Role, they're offering you a very unique experience of storytelling when you're seeing these characters during their best moments, their worst moments, and the in-between moments, the mundane moments, the moments when they're just going out shopping, when they're just, you know, making money so they can buy something, when they're just sitting around in their room talking about unimportant shit, you're seeing them be human. So in just 27 episodes, I got to know Molly better than any fictional character that I love. So when he died, heroically trying to save his fellow Mighty Nine members, it felt real. It felt like I had lost a friend, like I had lost a coworker, like I had known I had lost somebody that I had spent all these hours of all these days with and now he was gone and man it it really it really hit me hard um I didn't expect it to to the point that nowadays every time I see an empty chair at that uh at the critical role table it haunts me because the first thing that I think of is when Molly died. To the point that whenever I see any animatics or fan art referencing Molly's death, I instantly get that feeling again of dread, that same feeling of when he died. And that is an experience that no other form of media can replicate. Caduceus Clay. So, very much like I didn't know that D&D uh, &D characters could die, I also didn't know that a player could just rejoin the party as a different character, all right? I, I hope you find my naivete refreshing. Anyway, uh, so I, when Molly died, I legitimately thought that that was it for Taliesin. Like, Taliesin was done, he was off, he was going to do go do something else for a while while they finished campaign two. Um... So they go to the Blooming Grove to recruit a cleric, which they desperately need, no offense, Jester, uh, <laughs> to recruit a cleric to go and rescue the others from the Iron Shepherd. Um, and I believe they already had Sumali Montano as part of the, as part of the party uh, to help them go rescue the rest of the Mighty Nine. So that was cool. They have one awesome guest star as part of the show. And I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be another guest star. Who is it going to be? Uh, Will Friedel, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, Will Wheaton, who is it going to be this week? And boom, in walks in Taliesin as the character that I'm about to recruit. And I went, oh shit, okay, so you can just respawn as a different character. Okay, wow, that's, that's really cool. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> um, so that's that's a rule that I immediately uh, 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 found very appealing about D&D. Um, you can get another chance and you can design a better character and do things a little better. All right, cool. So, um, however, I thought, man, there's no way I'm going to like this new character more, just as much, if not more, than Molly. And just right away, right away when Molly, excuse me, Caduceus, walks out of his, uh, his, his the, I believe a temple or his hut in the Blooming Grove and sees the Mighty Nine, all with weapons, all looking at him. He looks at them and goes, I'm gonna go make some tea. And then he <laughs> leaves. I'm like, I love this guy. So while, while Molly was Lorne from Angel, Caduceus is the dude from the Big Lebowski. And I said that on Twitter, and then later, much, 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 much later, I started watching Tox Machina, and I watched the episode where, right after Caduceus was introduced, and Taliesin described Caduceus 
as what if the dude and Alan Watts had a baby and just left him in the jungle. Um, and I was like, oh, I got a third of the of the of the concoction right, uh, a third of the alchemy that it took to create uh, Caduceus. But um, the Mighty Nine, they're such a chaotic group, and I will talk about that a little bit later in the video. And they needed a little bit of balance. They needed somebody that was neutral, and Caduceus was the perfect addition. Taliesin's instincts were perfect. Yasha Nidoran. So, from the first episode, I liked all the characters except for Yasha. Um, and the reason for that is because Ashley was barely there. She was working on blind spots, so she would be in and out, in and out, in and out. So I remember like watching the show and um, I, I, back when I first started watching Critical Role, I would have to take all these notes because I could barely keep up with, with things. And I, I, I just didn't understand Dungeons and Dragons and uh, plot points would come back and, and Matt would say something and the cast would go, oh, and I would be lost. I'm like, what are they going oh for? What happened? I would be so lost. And... Um, and I would take notes, and I remember a note that I took on Yasha was, I can't get a bead on this character. I can't figure out who she is, what she's about. I don't think I like Yasha. Um, but it was because Ashley was gone for so much of the campaign. And later, I heard from a lot of you critters and Ginny D as well, that they had the exact same experience with Pike. And it wasn't that because Pike is a bad character, it was because Pike was barely there during a lot of the first few episodes of Campaign 1. So I had the same experience. It wasn't until they rescued Yasha from Oban, I think was his name. I'm sorry if I got the name wrong, the dude with the laughing hand and all that shit. I feel they rescued her and Yasha was spending more time with uh, the Mighty Nine, that I really started to like her. And I feel that Yasha is more like the Hulk than the Hulk. She is a character that has never lost a fight, but doesn't want to fight. Uh, she's somebody who's expected to be the baddest and the toughest all the time, but she doesn't see herself that way. She is somebody who who just wants to be married, have a family, um, have a peaceful, quiet life, literally smell the flowers. She loves picking flowers more than she loves, you know, killing people. But sadly, that's what she's good at. She's an instrument of war, instrument of war. She's a living weapon and that's what she's expected to always be. Um, and man, that is that is some deep, deep shit. And Ashley, when she got the chance, when she got to play an ongoing recurring role with uh, with uh, with um, with the campaign. After that, suddenly, uh, that's when I got into the character, and that's when I started to appreciate her. But she was the character that took me the longest to like. Jester Lavore. So you know that a series of any kind is really good when you have trouble picking a favorite character. And Campaign 2 of Critical Role was an example of me with every passing episode, I would have a different uh, favorite character. And the first character that I, that I liked, and probably the first character that you liked as well, was Jester. Jester is the mascot of Critical Role. She is everything, she embodies everything that makes Critical Role great. Just free expression at its finest. I had a science teacher who would constantly talk about the pleasure centers in the ear, how there are certain songs and certain catchphrases that we hear and they go into your ear and they hit all the pleasure centers in the ear and get into your brain 
and you instantly love it and you have to repeat it. You have to sing that song over and over again. You have to repeat that catchphrase over and over again. With Jester, Laura Bailey perfectly tuned into those pleasure centers in the ear with that voice and that accent and that performance that when you hear it, you just instantly love her and you instantly have to imitate her. Ah oh, man, everybody does a bad impersonation of Jester, even though they can't do it, just like me right now. Everybody just has to do it, you guys. Um, and it's so annoying, but when you hear it, it just stays with you and you have to fucking do it. So much so that nobody can be mad at Gene D for uh, making a living as a content creator primarily being a Jester impersonator. Nobody can because you can't help but imitate Jester. It's just one of those things. Um, so, oh my god, like as far, people keep asking me what I'm looking forward to the most as far as the animated series. I cannot wait to see general audiences be exposed to the media icon that is going to be Jester. Beauregard Lionette. So my second favorite character, the second character that I chose as being my favorite after Jester that I really got into was Bo. Now, I'm not going to get into, into this way too much because I'll get pissed off and then I'll start ranting. Um, but I had no clue that Marisha Ray had gone through such a rough time while playing Keyleth in campaign one and was harassed online. Not going to get into it. I'm just going to say that that was fucked. Um, the original campaign of Critical Role, at least the first third of that campaign, the, the cast was not being paid and they were doing it on their own free time. They, they didn't start to get compensated until the campaign, the, the show Critical Role became successful. Um, but they were doing it on their, off, on their own time, out of pocket. Um, so Marisha Ray is playing this character, going completely out of her way to play this character, and people were harassing her for it. That's fucked up, and that's where I'm going to end it. So literally, with uh, Bo, she went in the opposite direction in the, in the sense that while Keyleth cared too much, Bo didn't give a fuck. Just that... But Marisha could write a book on the art of not giving a fuck, just playing uh, Beauregard, just flat out not giving a shit. So I find it uh, ironic and wonderful that she plays a character that doesn't give a shit and instantly people, people like her, um, which is the perfect formula uh, for a teenager. She's playing this apathetic surfer teen and everybody loves her in spite of the fact that she doesn't give a fuck about you. She doesn't give a shit about anything. Um, she's just there to be chaotic and have a good time in her own way. And it was awesome. And just her watching her enjoy playing that character, watching her have no filter and just enjoy herself and just be one of the coolest characters in the group with little to no effort instantly made her a legend in my eyes and why uh, Bo was the second character that I instantly gravitated towards. Not the brave. So the third character that became my favorite uh, was not. Uh, again, going back to um, the cast members going in the opposite direction. As all most of you know, Scanlan was my favorite character of campaign one, uh, in spite of the fact that he is a womanizing horn dog. But he's a character that's free, that lives his own way, and is unapologetically himself no matter what. And I love characters like that. Um, so with Not, not only does Sam choose to play a character that's very uncomfortable in her own skin and has very little confidence in herself, but to play a woman. <laughs> you know, he went from playing a womanizer to playing a woman. Um, just what an incredibly bold choice. Like, you watch campaign one and you think you understand what Sam Regal is good at. And then he went completely in the opposite direction and he's even better. Just, in my humble opinion, Not the Brave is Sam Regal's greatest performance of his career thus far. 
And he has done a lot of incredible things. Just look at his IMDb. Um, both uh, as a performer and as somebody behind the scenes. Um, but Not was just an amazing uh, character study of somebody who doesn't feel comfortable in their own body, but had, is so determined to succeed for their family, for their friends, that they will brave anything, even things that they are scared of. Like, um, I, I don't know the appropriate term for it, but uh, not is afraid of water, is aquaphobic. I know that's not the right, I cannot be the right term. I will put the right term here. Um, and to brave those things just because she has to succeed as this mission. She has to fix things to get back together with her husband, get back together uh, with her son, um, and to help her best friend Caleb succeed at what he's trying to achieve. Um, and then by extension, the rest of the Mighty Nine, when they become her extended family. Um, as I was writing my uh, Twitter thread, uh, describing my experience with this show and how blown away I was with this character and everything this character represented. Um, I kept hearing from all these trans people talking about how this is the first time they ever felt represented in a piece of popular media. And that blew me away that uh, this character that to me just represented, from my point of view, I should say, represented somebody that just is growing up and it had, just hasn't come into himself, just hasn't figured out who she is yet. Um, to the trans community, it meant so much more than that. Oh my God, so much fucking more than that. Um, and just listening to their stories and their perspective on this was fascinating and inspiring and it gave me an even bigger respect for Sam Regal than I already had. He was already my favorite cast member in um, Campaign 1. Um, and now he was my favorite performer in Campaign 2. Caleb Widogast. So, one last time. After Jester was my favorite character. And then... Bo took her place as my favorite character, and then Not took her place uh, as my favorite character. I was really loving uh, the, the women this campaign. Eventually, they were all replaced. Uh, I still love them, but they were all replaced uh, by Caleb Widogast as my favorite character. Who's not just my favorite character of Campaign 2, but is my favorite character in all of Critical Role. Now, to be clear, just, uh, just to put you at ease, I'm not a war criminal. I've never killed anybody. I've never burned anything down. Um, but when I tell you that never in my life I have related to a fictional character more than Caleb Widogast, I hope you appreciate and understand the weight of those words. I'm not going to go into detail because it's very personal, um, but oh my god, I am so appreciative of Liam O'Brien for playing this character that's so personal to him and his personal experience and his life and plugging all those, these very intimate things into this character because everything about Caleb felt so real to me and more often than not even though Caleb's experiences don't match my experiences verbatim who he is who those experiences uh turned him into um felt so close to my own experience and more often than not I would be watching campaign two and Caleb would do something and say some or say something, and I would think, oh my God, that's me. Um, and again, uh, when I experience that with other characters in other forms of media, um, it wouldn't ha that wouldn't happen as often as it would happen 
with Caleb. And then on top of that, um, people constantly ask me what my favorite ship on uh, Critical Role is. Every ha everybody has their own personal favorite uh, relationship in uh, Critical Role. Uh, my favorite ship in Critical Role is just Caleb and Knott's friendship. That's it. Um, it reminds me a lot of Marsha and I. And again, I'm not going to get into, into it too deeply because then I'll get too emotional. But I deeply appreciate that Liam and Sam decided to plug their own personal friendship into these characters and into this campaign. Because their friendship is very real. It's very powerful. So much so that it is the their friendship is what inadvertently created Critical Role. All, all Liam wanted to do was get drunk and play Dungeons and Dragons with his friends for his birthday. That's all he wanted to do for his birthday. And because Sam loves him so fucking much, he made it he made that happen. And that is what started the very unlikely series of events that created Critical Role. It all started from these two men's friendship. These two people's love for one another, cre by accident, created Critical Role. And now they were putting that love and that relationship into the campaign. And it was the most real relationship that I've seen in any in anything that I've ever seen before um, so much so that I would often see the way, way they would interact and the way they they would their interactions would develop together and I would see and I would think man that was me and Marsha that was the way we treated each other the way we interacted the way um, the way we loved each other um, So, and then on top and top on top of that, Caleb was somebody that I greatly related to and just I was always rooting for. I would see his development from the shy, introverted individual into the incredible sorcerer that he become the incredible sorcerer that not and pretty much everybody around him knew that he was and i saw myself in that and man i know that the cast and liam o'brien will never see this but i am so grateful to them thank you so much for creating that experience and creating that character Because he means the world to me. And now to talk about my favorite episode. Campaign 2, episode 29, The Stalking Nightmare. So, remember how I said that as horrible as Molly's death was, it led to something great? Uh, it led to my favorite episode of the campaign. Um, 29, which was a live show when they go and they storm the Iron Shepherd's stronghold to rescue the rest of the Mighty Nine. It was a live show and man it sucks that they don't do live shows anymore but I get it there's still COVID concerns and then on top of that the cast is experiencing the most difficult period of their lives. Um, not only are they still producing Critical Role not only are they still active uh, voice actors but they're also you know making their animated shows with amazon studios so they're insanely busy these days so i understand why um they don't have the time to divert and do a live episode of critical role um but like 
everyone, this was a mission that I understood. I love the Mighty Nine. I want them to rescue uh, Jester and Ford and Yasha, even though I wasn't really into Yasha at the time. Um, I need them to rescue these characters. I'm really into it. I fully understand the mission. I was on the edge of my seat the whole freaking episode. Uh, love Ashley Birch. Love that um, Carrie Payton showed up as Shakasta, the coolest guest star they've ever had. Can't wait to see him in animated form. Um, and then on top of all that, on top of the tension of it all, uh, the energy from the crowd was amazing. Just and again, even back then, I still really don't, didn't understand the rules of Dungeons and Dragons and how it really, how it fully works. So the crowd reactions helped a lot for me to understand what every, what the rules meant and what all the different uh, uh, game rules meant. Just the reactions helped. All right, bear with me. I was a novice. Anyway, so I was such a noob. Anyway, so. The episode is like over three hours, maybe four hours long, and when I tell you that I was at the edge of my seat, just focused on my computer screen the whole time, every minute, every minute, um, to the point that when the episode was over and I stood up, I, my butt was so sweaty from just sitting in the chair for that long. Um, I didn't take a break, I didn't go to the bathroom, I didn't go get a drink, I didn't. I just watched Critical Role that whole time, I was so into it. Caleb got the how you wanna do this and delivered my favorite action hero line of the whole campaign, which is, you shouldn't have killed my cat. And then it ends perfectly with them saving the rest of the Mighty Nine from the Iron Shepherds, even though uh, apparently Matt intended for Lorenzo to get away, uh, not, a, not, not today, Satan. That's what Bo said. Um, <laughs> and they, they stop Lorenzo. They rescue the Mighty Nine. And then Sam perfectly puts the button on that scene when he goes up to Jester's prone, tied body and says, case closed. Perfect. So why? Why does Campaign 2 resonate with people so much? Why are people so obsessed with it? Why was I so hooked on it that I watched one episode after the other and then after 500 plus hours of watching Campaign 2, when I got to the end, I was disappointed that I didn't have more Campaign 2 to watch. Why? I think it comes down to two things. Uh, number one, like I said, Campaign 1, it wasn't intended to be seen. This was just a private game that they were playing. So Campaign 2 was the first campaign that they did that was intended to be seen. So it was planned for accordingly by Matt. The story was designed to be uh, consumed by an audience. So there's that. And then while the Vox Machina characters were idealized versions of a lot of the cast or exaggerate versions of the cast. Um, for Campaign 2, they purposely went with characters that were terribly flawed. Um, a lot of people uh, like to talk about what analogs they choose for the characters of Critical Role. Um, I've often said that I, I believe that I describe Vox Machina as being the Guardians of the Galaxy, but in a sword and sorcery setting. They are assholes who are trying to prove themselves. The Bell's Hells get often compared to the X-Men, and I respect that opinion, but to me they're more like the Creature Commandos. They are monsters, they are the last people, the last characters you would expect to be heroes, but they are. Um, they are... They, sh they should be the ones terrorizing. They should be the ones to inflict fear, but they are the ones who are going to rescue you. Uh, except for Orm. Orm is just perfect. He's perfect, man. So, Campaign 2, the Mighty Nine, I like to compare them to the Leverage team. They are all former criminals and misfits who decided to become good guys because sometimes bad guys make the, be the best good guys. They understand how people in their line of work think and they are the best qualified as stopping people like that. 
So at the beginning, you meet these these characters that are horrifically flawed. They are far from perfect. N Every member of the Mighty Nine when the campaign starts is wanted somewhere by the law. Um, you have a pirate, a graffiti artist who specializes in defacing temples of all things, um, a former war criminal, a smuggler, a con artist, a killer, and a thief. Okay? Um, then later Caduceus thankfully joins the group and he's fine. He's just, you know, uh, a cleric of the Blooming Grove and thank God he joined because they needed somebody that was neutral. But you have all these criminals and misfits um, who don't believe that they can be good but decide to use their skills that they garnered as criminals and misfits to, to do good. And it works. And I love every moment in the campaign when they would stop and think to themselves, are we the baddies? And that's the way it should be. Um, life is not black and white life. There's a lot of gray. You know, there's a lot of gray in life. Nobody is ever 100% good or 100% bad. Uh, people make choices. Good is not something that you are, it's something that you do. You can make good choices or bad choices, but you're never 100% good or 100% bad. And that makes the Mighty Nine so easy to relate to. Um, I think it's the campaign where anybody who watches it, like me, can find a character that they 100% relate to, 100% see themselves as. And that's why I think campaign two, those two reasons, Matt prepared storytelling, storytelling that was designed to be viewed, and these amazing characters that were very personal to the cast. And because they were so personal, they became personal to the viewing audience. So there you go. That's my theory and I'm sticking to it. If you have more to add to that, you are more than welcome to add your thoughts in the comment section below. And last but not least, probably the most important part of this video, the thing that I'm going to leave you all with. I have been a content creator for 12 years now. In those 12 years, I have interacted with every fan group known to man, every fan community known to man. And while, as you can see from all the action figures, all the merch behind me, there's a lot of things that I like. There's a lot of uh, fiction I, out there that I consume. But I never identify with any of the fan communities that are related to to those fictions. I don't consider myself uh, to be a Trekkie or a Ringer or any other fan group name because it has been my experience as a content creator interacting with those individuals that every single one of those fan groups has a a subgroup within it, a very loud, belligerent subgroup that just gives the rest of the group a, a bad a bad name. Um, generally, gatekeepers and naysayers that feel like they have something to protect, but by doing so, they all they do is drive people away and i hate that i feel that fandom should unite us not separate us um and the moment you use your fandom as a weapon to hurt other people or harass other people um you're no longer a fan you are a zealot you are what people have have uh referred to in modern times as a snyder cultist um, <laughs> Uh, where you're not a fan, you're just obsessed with one little part of that fandom and you're using it to harass others and that's unacceptable. Um, and not just harass other fans, but also harass the creators with how you think the story so should be told, how you think that that role should be casted, that character should be portrayed. There's a difference between taking something seriously and taking it personally. And the moment you start taking it personally, 
uh, and believing that they are hurting you by continuing to tell a story or continuing to portray a character, um, you've gone from being somebody that enjoys it to somebody that's just hopelessly uh, unhealth, obsessed with it on an, un on an unhealthy level. And that's why up until a few months ago, I didn't identify with any particular fan group. As most of you have noticed, I have always only referred to myself as a fanboy, never saying, oh, I'm a Trekkie, oh, I am a this, oh, I am a that. Until I started to interact with the Critical Role fans, until I started to interact with the Critters. There's something about watching people who watch Critical Role, and I think it's because Watching Critical Role, because the episodes are so long and it requires active viewing, that the large, the primary group that watches Critical Role, they are required to have patience and they are required to have imagination. Um, and because of that, they are the coolest, most accepting fan group that I have ever interact, interacted with. If you're watching this and you're a critter, I completely understand why um, almost every episode of Critical Role, Matt Mercer says, I love you. If you're a critter, I love you. You are among, you are the coolest fan group I have ever had the pleasure of having conversations with, interacting with, having a laugh with. You are excellent. Because I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, I didn't think that I would, could count myself in your ranks. And I had this beautiful conversation with uh, a group of critters on Twitter uh, about that. And they, and a lot of them, like I said at the beginning of this video, said, I've never played either. either. I'm a critter. If you watch it, you understand it, and you love it, you're a critter too. So I am admitting it publicly for the first time ever in my life and in my career as a content creator, I identified with a group. I am a critter.